All right. So hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us for the UNLV College of Education Scholarship in Practice web series. I'm super excited about this event. Uh, since I was approached about this presentation idea by Jen Oshiro Rivers last fall semester. Th so thank you so much, Jen, for planting the seed uh, for this vision and Young Bok Kim uh, for the behind the scenes tech logistics. So the title of this webinar is The ABCs and 123s of MSIs, An Introduction to Minority Serving Institutions. It is also day two of UNLV's Minority Serving Institution Week, so a happy UNLV MSI week. And if you are around Las Vegas, you are welcome to join different celebration events in person and online for UNLV MSI week. So this is going to be as interactive as possible for a webinar. I know I can't see you. Uh, and while you can see me, I welcome you to chime in to the Zoom chat. Please introduce yourselves. I'm going to try to, you know, flip back and forth with that. Uh, let me know where you're joining from and even what brings you here. So as I proceed, please feel free to add questions to the Q&A function. Uh, there will be a dedicated Q&A section at the end of this formal presentation. Uh, and if you are surprised, love what you're hearing, confused, just want to show some love, I want to see your reactions. Uh, so please use the reaction feature to send emojis my way. Uh, and then as I shared, there will be a Q&A. Uh, and in addition to typing out your questions, uh, you might be able to address um, I might be able to address folks by raising your hand or using that hand feature later on if you prefer to voice your question. So as we get going again, I welcome everyone to introduce yourselves. Please say hello. Where are you tuning in from? What brings you here? So I'm Christine Jan Espinoza, and I am a PhD candidate in the higher education program at the UNLV College of Education. And I've been living in Las Vegas since August of 2019. So prior to starting this PhD program, I worked full time as the student affairs officer in the UCLA Asian American Studies Department, which is one of four ethnic studies academic departments at UCLA. <laughs> so now why this title? Why are we hosting an ABCs and 123s of MSIs? So I've come to learn that there is kind of a continuum of knowledge around what is an MSI? What do all of these letters stand for? What eligibility criteria are? let alone what federal policy it derives from. So I know that's quite a large order. And in fact, at UNLV, uh, we offer an understanding minority serving institution graduate seminar that spans the entire semester. And I took that class in spring of 2020, and I was a graduate teaching assistant for that course in spring of 2022 with my advisor and dissertation chair, shout out to Dr. Blanca Rincon, and Dr. Frederick No, who is also part of my dissertation committee, is teaching that seminar right now for this um, spring 2024 semester. So there is going to be a lot that I'm not going to touch on. So realistically, today's focus and learning objective is really just to be introduced to MSI basics, to help us get some shared language around MSIs, including what do these acronyms stand for? basic eligibility criteria, specifically enrollment, if applicable, the types of MSIs. And then I'll give a little bit extra on two specific classifications, so more on that later. Uh, and then by the end of this presentation, you can expect to take away at least one thing, or maybe one new thing, about MSIs. All right, so in this webinar, uh, I'll just be walking us through, you know, who I am with respect to this topic, my position and posture, if you will, because in general, who we are matters in this work. Next is a quiz-like review, just to see where we're at. What do you know about MSIs? Third will be a larger overview of the ABCs and 123s, a bird's eye view of the active, different U.S. Department of Education MSI classifications. And then I'm going to dive into HSIs and NAPZ specifically. And if you don't know what those acronyms mean, that is okay. That is why there's that pop quiz and the ABCs and 123s segment. Um, then I have some nuggets or just, you know, prompts to have us think about some things. And then I'll open up for questions formally. So again, I welcome you to use the chat feature, the reactions and questions in the Q&A. So as I said, it is really important for me to share what brings me to MSIs because it relates to, you know, how I came to this topic and the way I talk about these institutions. So my route to and through higher education 
was at, you know, two-year and four-year public minority-serving institutions. So I am a second-generation Panay, a Filipina-American, and I was the first in my family to be born in the United States. And I'm a first-generation U.S. college student. I made my way to and through higher ed as a community college transfer student from Long Beach City College in Southern California to the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Then fast forward, I'm at UNLV. So as you can see, just even from the slide, I've attended Asian American and Pacific Islander serving institutions, Hispanic serving institutions, and a Native Hawaiian serving institution. At the campus level, I've been pretty involved. Uh, I am part of the UNLV's uh, Minority Serving Institution Student Council, which is a group of undergraduate and graduate students working to advance UNLV's identity as an MSI. So special shout out to our current advisor, Deanna McDonald, and former advisor, Dr. Renee Watson. And a special shout out to the current MSI student council members, Anel Rojas, Scheherazade Pollins, and Mia Bruce. I also serve on the Data and Assessment Subcommittee. I'm currently the grad assistant for National Science Foundation Hispanic Serving Institution Resource Hub Grant, recently funded at UNLV with Dr. Blanca Rincon, Vanessa Bunkaluk, Aisha Jackson, Melissa Morris, and Eduardo Robleto. And I formerly worked for a, uh, a different NSF HSI grant previously. Nationally, I have served on the National Anapizi Steering Committee. I was one of two students on that committee. We served alongside college presidents, faculty, staff. I've had the opportunity to conduct research in policy briefs like the ones pictured on this slide under the research mentorship of Dr. Mike Wawin, who is now at New York University. And then last year, I interned with the State Higher Education Executive Officers Association, or SHEO, and through that, I worked with the MSI Data Project, which is also overseen by the same Dr. Mike Wawin. And then the photos you see on this slide capture me at my Master of Education graduation, as well as events I have been part of on campus. So shout out to the UNLV and a PZ program with Kyle Ethelbaugh and Mo from CAEO. Uh, and then the bottom is a panel with APIA scholars back in 2022, celebrating 15 years of Anna PZs. I know that was a lot, right? So you can see kind of, you know, where I went to school, what I'm involved in is really what grounds me and are part of how I come to MSIs. All right, pop quiz. And I think that gave us a little bit of wiggle room to get some more folks into this Zoom webinar. So uh, at this time, um, you will see a pop-up window on your screen with 10 questions, and I'm give, gonna give you all a moment to read through all of that. First question, how many active U.S. Department of Education minority serving institution classifications exist? So citing Dr. Mike Wawin and the colleague and his colleagues list, there are 11 active MSI classifications. I do want to add that there, um, there is a U.S. Department of Education um, listing for a master, oops, a master's degree program at predominantly black institutions or PBI masters. And there were five institutions eligible to apply for and receive grants for that PBI master's program. So including Chicago State University, Long Island University, Brooklyn campus, Robert Morris University, Washington Adventist University, formerly Columbia Union College, and then finally York College. But this program is only funded $500,000 annually for six years from fiscal year or so FY 2009 to 2014. So hence, while you could argue that there are more than 11 classifications, I just wanted to highlight the active MSI classifications or programs. Which MSI classifications are tied to historically black colleges and universities? So there are three that are tied. HBCUs, master's degree programs at HBCUs, historically black graduate institutions or HBGIs, 
Uh, and just an FYI, there is one HBGI that is not a historically black college or university because it does not meet the federal criteria to be an HBCU. And that is Charles R. Drew University of Medicine and Science in Los Angeles, California, where I'm from. How many MSI classifications are tied to Hispanic serving institutions or HSIs? So there are three tied to HSIs. Now, which are the three MSI classifications that are tied to HSIs? This includes the Developing Hispanic Serving Institution, or DHSI or HSI, the Hispanic Serving Institution STEM and Articulation, or HSI STEM, uh, and then finally, the Promoting Post-Baccalaureate Opportunities for Hispanic Americans, POHA, or HSI POHA. When were HSI, HSIs codified into law? So they gained official federal recognition with the reauthorization of the Higher Education Act in 1992. What is the enrollment percentage threshold for HSIs? So institutions must meet a minimum enrollment threshold of 25% Hispanic and Latino undergraduates per IPEDS. So that's the language I just used from IPEDS. When were anapeses codified into law? So it was in 2007 with the signing of the College Cost Reduction and Access Act or CCRAA by former President George W. Bush. And then if it was further expanded in 2008. Who first introduced the anapeses legislation in the United States Congress? So it was Honorable Robert Underwood, former U.S. Congressperson from Guam, uh, and he was also the former president of the University of Guam, who first introduced the NPC legislation back in 2002. Did you all know any of this? I know I'm like almost done. Which undergraduates are counted for the NPC enrollment percentage threshold? So this threshold actually only counts Asian American and Pacific Islander students. So I wanna stop on this for a moment, two things. This enrollment eligibility does not include Asian or Pacific Islander international students, nor does it count Asian, and Asian or Pacific Islander students who are classified under two or more races. Second, I want to clarify that the Native American Pacific Islander part in Anapizi or Anapizi uh, actually refers to Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders, um, or as you may have seen in iPads as NHPI or Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander. However, while they are known in the United States as NHPI, Pacific Islanders have a claim to be indigenous people of the Pacific. So that's where you get the Native American Pacific Islander. Finally, last question, what is the enrollment percentage threshold for anapeses? So that is a 10% uh, enrollment threshold of Asian Americans and or Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander undergraduate students. All right, so I know we've been covering a few things already just based on that quiz alone, but I figure let's look at all of these active MSI classifications together. So this is the full list of 11 active MSI classifications that I will be referring to. So again, this comes from Dr. Mike Baldwin uh, and his colleagues, and this is also cited in a Congressional Research Service report. So I know this is a big table, so I'm going to just quickly walk you through how to read uh, this table. The first column is the full name of the classification. The second column is the acronym. Third is the year these gained federal recognition. But I really think it is important for me to note that many, many of these MSIs existed before uh, formal federal recognition uh, and have existed for more than, you know, 180 years. Uh, next is where can you find this classification in the Higher Education Act or the HEA? 
And then finally, this last column is the enrollment criteria, if there are any. I do wanna emphasize very quickly that I'm focusing on the US Department of Education MSI programs, but that there are other federal agencies that also fund these institutions, as pictured here, like the National Science Foundation, Improving Undergraduate STEM Education, or IUS Hispanic Serving Institution Program. And below is a fun screenshot of the HSI resource hub that I work for. So to make sense of these classifications, researchers have described these different MSIs as mission-based and enrollment-based. So let's just start with the mission-based classifications. The first of, my, of the minority-serving institutions were really mission-based minority-serving institutions with a historical mission to serve Native and Black and African-American communities. And as you can see, they do not have an enrollment criteria attached to them. So these include HBCUs, HBGIs, HBCU masters, and tribally controlled colleges and universities, um, including some of the ones that I've highlighted quickly here. HBCUs, right, were founded with a unique history of service to Black communities, uh, established primarily through missionary groups, philanthropists, the Freedmen's Bureau. The second Morrill Act in 1890 established public historically Black colleges and universities, paralleling at least in creation alone the existing white land grants, or rather land grab universities. Um, and then when the Higher Education Act of 1965 was passed, HBCUs were redefined as any college or university that was established prior to 1964, whose principal mission was and is the education of Black Americans. Uh, and then this gave access to federal, uh, federal monies. So you might be wondering why the date of 1964. So remember, uh, this is around the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and when desegregation of historically uh, white colleges and universities began to happen. Now, you might also be wondering, why do I have 1986 listed as the year for federal recognition on this table? Well, it was 20 years later in 1986 when the Strengthening Historically Black Colleges and Universities Clause was added to the Higher Education Act to provide non-competitive federal funding for HBCUs to, to remedy, you know, so many past racial injustices. So history of enslavement and a very, 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 very long period of federal underfunding and neglect of historically black colleges and universities. Now, tribally controlled colleges and universities are institutions that um, were chartered or established by the respective American Indian tribes or by the federal government to provide higher education for Native American communities. And most were founded uh, in the 1960s, starting with um, Dine College, which was formerly known as Navajo Community College. And these institutions really focused on tribal culture and language with the goal of advancing Native or Indigenous self-governance. Uh, and also kind of similar to how the formal HBCU definition came later, it was not until the Tribally Controlled Community College Assistance Act of 1978 that uh, TCCUs uh, were federally defined, you know, as an institution of higher education, which was formerly controlled or formally sanctioned or chartered by the governing body of an Indian tribe or tribes, making them eligible for non-competitive federal funding. So again, here, a goal was to remedy uh, past injustices. Now with regard to enrollment-based classifications. So these enrollment-based MSIs are colleges and universities that are historically or predominantly white institutions that have reached a federally defined racial or ethnic threshold to qualify for their MSI status. Um, and you know, these enrollment-based MSIs must maintain these certain um, undergraduate thresholds uh, in addition to find, um, finance requirements as noted in the Higher Education Act, which I'm not uh, focusing on here. So that's very different, right, uh, from just what I was sharing about HBCUs and tribally controlled colleges and universities. Because as you can see from this mega list of enrollment eligibility criteria here on the right side of that table, you know, that can shift whether or not an institution is going to meet any of these given enrollment-based MSI classifications year to year. So one year they could be eligible and another year maybe they're not. I, I do want to also note that there were a, select, a few select post-secondary institutions that were established with the express purpose, though, of ser serving certain students and specifically serving Latina, Latino, Latinx students 
including Hostos Community College and Boricua College in New York, St. Augustine in Illinois, and the National Hispanic University and DQ University in California, which has since closed. Um, I, I just wanted to, you know, name that. Uh, and also colleges and universities, universities in Puerto Rico were also established to educate residents on the island who are per primarily Hispanic or Latina, Latino, Latinx, right? So again, I'm just highlighting that these are, you know, some exceptions uh, to that larger enrollment base based um, definition. Uh, and then of these enrollment-based MSIs, Hispanic serving institutions or HSIs were really the first uh, enrollment-based MSI to gain federal recognition. Okay, so maybe you're starting to think about funding. Uh, so very briefly, uh, this came. This comes from a policy brief that I also helped co-author, and we calculated this out based on the amount of allocation monies that came out during fiscal year 2022, uh, and then divided that by the number of um, eligible um, certain MSIs in that year. So this figure represents that current that fiscal year's MSI funding per capita. That's what that means per institution. If all the institutions were given that uh, equ are equally funded, uh, so what these dollar amounts represent at the top is that funding per institution. If all the eligible institutions would have gotten funding. Okay, and just as a reminder, this is the number of eligible institutions at that point in 2022. Uh, so despite maintaining the two largest numbers of eligible institutions, as you can kind of see, anapesis and HSIs, that's HSIs in the aggregate, uh, are actually the least funded classifications. And also because they are now representing the two class, uh, you know, these classifications with the largest number of eligible institutions, I will be focusing on them. So sadly, I wish I had time to provide an overview uh, that is much longer than this talk uh, regarding where these um, the historical and contemporary basis for each of these classifications. But again, if you're interested, this is my um, my free marketing for that graduate seminar on understanding minority serving institutions at UNLV. So as promised, I'm just going to give a little bit extra on HSIs and anapesis, considering their continued growth in the United States higher education landscape. So I'm going to give like a brief timeline to share and then other fun tidbits. So as I said earlier, HSIs uh, are really the first enrollment based minority serving institutions to exist. And just to jog your memories, right, this includes the DHSI or HSI program, the uh, POHA, the Promoting Post-Baccalaureate Opportunities for Hispanic Americans, uh, and then HSI STEM, the Hispanic Serving Institutions, uh, Science, Technology, Engineering, Mathematics, and Articulation. So to date, Excelencia in Education reports that HSIs make up about 20% of all colleges and universities and enroll 63% of Latino undergraduate students. And that number of HSIs is growing significantly. Moreover, HSIs are you know, geographically concentrated uh, and spread out. Oh, yes, uh, they're spread across 30 states and geographically concentrated uh, with California having the most HSIs, followed by Texas, Puerto Rico, and New York per excellency on education. So I'm gonna skip, give you a second to absorb this information on this, on this slide, but then I also wanted to provide, um, you know, some resource here. So now, as you can see, and as you can remember from the pop quiz, while Hispanic serving institutions gained federal recognition in 1992, advocacy efforts really span a much longer history. And this is an abbreviated timeline. This does not include everything that I would like. Uh, but again, right, this is just your brief intro into uh, MSIs and HSIs and APZs specifically. So the history of advocacy for HSIs stem from the civil rights movement and Latinx leaders really lobbied Congress for, I want to say, even over a decade, almost two decades, right? Uh, and the original advocates sought to create a Hispanic serving, in, uh, serving designation that went beyond the percentage designation that we see today, right? That 25%, that was not the only thing that was advocated for. They really wanted institutions that had programs and services focused on supporting Latinx students, um, staff and faculty that reflected Latinx demographics and an explicit commitment to Latinx learners and the Latinx community. So, you know, towards recognition at this federal level, 
the testimonies that were given at the time uh, really had some major themes such as uh, Latino, Latino, Latinx students lacked access to some higher education institutions. Many did not complete degree programs. Uh, that they were concentrated at institutions that also receive limited federal funding. So, right, fast forward to today. Now, uh, federal code designates Hispanic serving institutions, and that acknowledges, you know, that there were there are colleges, and universities that are um, enrolling more and more uh, Hispanic and Latino students. So again, it was re. It was through the re sorry, so it was through the reauthorization of the Higher Education Act in 1992, uh, and they were originally um, created under Title III. Uh, it was in the reauthorization of the Higher Education Act in 1998 was when HSIs were then placed. The developing HSIs were then placed under Title V. Uh, and that was out of a compromise with HBCU leaders at the time who were concerned. Uh, and then now fast forward to today, HSI now represent, right, the largest number of eligible uh, minority serving institutions, and we can expect them to grow uh, even more in the future. And now thinking about HSIs beyond federal recognition, higher education scholars, including, you know, Dr. Regina Garcia, Anne-Marie Nunez, Maricela Cuellar, Vanessa Sansone, Vega, Dr. Roman Lira, so many others that I'm not naming yet in this space, you know, have been pushing us to think about understanding servingness, that S in the HSI, and even reframing the H and centering Latina Latinx students uh, in HSIs. Uh, I just wanted to feature, you know, just some screenshots here. There are so many, right, that... Uh, we have yet to push ourselves to think of, think beyond um, this federal designation, uh, the federal um, definition. All right, Anna Pizzi's Asian American and Native American Pacific Islander serving institutions. So to date, while Anna Pizzi's uh, represent really 6% of all colleges and universities in the United States. Uh, Anapizis enroll over 40% of all Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander undergraduates in the country. Uh, they also award nearly 50% of all um, associate degrees and 37% of all baccalaureate degrees earned by AA and NHPI students. And as far as how many anapesis there are, the number of colleges and universities eligible to receive funding continues to grow. Uh, it was an 81% growth in the past few years. Uh, yet, while the number of eligible anapesis is also growing, that number of funded institutions has hovered constant. So before I get into a very similar abbreviated timeline, I just wanted to um, importantly name how it was an uphill battle also for anapesis, but uh, for a different reason. So there has been a persisting stubborn and widespread stereotyping of Asian Americans specifically uh, as a model minority. Uh, and so scholars have, you know, um, I'm citing here, have summarized how this can be thought of as a deminoritization. And deminoritization refers to the rendering of Asian Americans as not a minority group. And we see this play out, you know, in how folks talk about people of color and often leaving out Asian Americans. Uh, and then defining Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, particularly Asian Americans monolithically as a hardworking group with high achievement undercuts claims of systemic racism made by other uh, communities of color. And I, I also want to name importantly that you know, a lot of this is because of this perpetuated model minority myth that complies with an anti-Black and white supremacist agenda and uses two interlocking elements to reproduce and reinforce this. So one, that Asian Americans are strategically presented as a model of um, self-sufficient minority success. And number two, that Asian American success is then used to um, blame other groups for their struggles. So why am I saying all of this? Uh, it is going, you're going to see this kind of play out in this abbreviated timeline. So here is a very similar short timeline of anapesis. Uh, the seeds of advocacy for anapesis began in the late 1980s and early 1990s. So Congress, uh, Congress members Robert Matsui, Democrat from California, and uh, Congress uh, member Norman Miet, Mineta, a Democrat also from California, objected to the exclusion of Asian American and Pacific Islander students from minority student counts regarding MSI status as early as 1986. And then we see more advocacy in the 1990s as AAPI leaders lobbied Congress to establish the designation. 
Uh, so the tipping point really came in. So if you can go to the 1999 uh, section where there was a release of a college board um, report titled Reaching the Top. And it painted the picture of Asian American students already reaching the top. Uh, but there was a big limitation if you looked at the data. It focused only on middle class East Asian American students. Uh, and then later that in, in that year, by June 1999, uh, the White House Initiative on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders was formed. And they recommended a version of the AAPI serving institution to be created. So Right, like the similar the slide before, the motivating factors was really just again just challenging this persistent model minority myth about Asian Americans and then Pacific Islanders Islanders by pan ethnic association. Uh, the emphasis on the importance of an official codification of Asian American and Pacific Islanders as a minority group in federal designation. And then finally, by creating the ANAPC designation, it was an impetus, uh, you know, trying to get other federal agencies to include Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders in future funding opportunities because they were left out. Uh, and then moving on, uh, right from the quiz that you had done. Uh, it was former Congressperson Robert Underwood from Guam who introduced the bill to amend Title III of the Higher Education Act to create the AAPI serving institutions uh, in 2002. Uh, and then it, it didn't quite pass then. You know, there were several other iterations that happened afterwards, but they find anapesis finally gained federal recognition uh, in September of 2007. Uh, and by the way, that's also why National Anapesi Week happens around end of September, because that was the same time that it was signed into law. Uh, and then I've also included here, you know, there has the White House initiative has also been uh, relaunched, uh, renamed also it's the White House Initiative on Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders. Right. So similar to the slide that I had for HSIs, these are just some fun tidbits if you want to learn more because there's so much more to learn, right, about these institutions. And here I highlight uh, a book that really focused on um, pra uh, practice practitioners who are really on the front lines of really pushing institutions around what does it mean to be an anapesi, some policy briefs, some of which I've also worked on. I wanted to highlight the Asian Pacific Americans in higher education um, or Apahi here, they are going to have their conference uh, next week, and they have an, uh, an, a pre-conference regarding anapesis. And then finally, uh, I wanted to show this um, very recent release from the White House Initiative on Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders, because they're also, you know, incorporating advocacy work for anapesis at this time. So that's new. <laughs> All right, so again, given the limited timing of this presentation, um, I, I just wanted to move us along to what are other things that we can start thinking about? And this is not going to be a very exhaustive list. I kind of just wanted to leave it open-ended and hope to get a sense of what you all are thinking about now. So one major thing, and also um, just a little bit about myself, I'm really interested in institutions that meet dual and multiple MSI classifications. So as an example, you know, if we just use this classification uh, and based on the fiscal year 2023 eligibility matrix, if we think of the schools here in, uh, in the Nevada system of higher education, right, like UNLV, for example, it is an eligible HSI, it's eligible for HSI POHA, eligible for HSI STEM, and it is a funded ANAPZ with, part, with both Part A and Part F. College of Southern Nevada, it's a funded Hispanic serving institution, it's eligible for HSI STEM, and it was previously eligible as an anapesi, but it was not listed as of fiscal year 2023. Nevada State University it is a funded HSI, eligible HSI POHA, um, and an eligible anapesi. I also wanted to highlight how there are institutions with even more than um, these three or four. York College, which I highlighted earlier, right? It's an eligible anapesi, an eligible HSI, eligible HSI POHA, eligible HSI STEM, funded PBI, and also previously was a funded PBI master's. So uh, there are implications there, right, uh, that you can kind of imagine where else this can go and how folks are trying to think about it on these campuses, if they are at all. So I kind of left these all uh, a little bit more broad, right, because it can go in all sorts of directions. I'm sure each of you are really kind of trying to take it in of, what are the implications for, for 
uh, your respective units, right? For students, you know, as a student myself, I have been thinking about like, how am I experiencing the campus? What more I would like to see as faculty, you know, um, I, I think about faculty representation, um, as well as cluster hiring, what could we do to align with now being uh, these very specific MSI classifications for administrators, for staff similarly, for alums, maybe your institutions were not yet meeting these MSI um, classifications before, but now they do. But alumni also have a role, right, in pressing the university to uh, really align more with these uh, MSI classifications. And then I also, you know, wanted to leave that tidbit of expanding beyond traditional or normative academic metrics, thinking about things like the physical campus, like does it feel like an MSI, an HSI, an anapesi as you walk through campus? Are there things that represent uh, these racially minoritized and other minoritized communities? Okay, so very quick wrap up, takeaway or baon. Uh, my parents speak both Tagalog and Pangasinan or Pangasinanse. And uh, baon in Tagalog means it's uh, like a take home, uh, money, food, or other provision. So these are your baon or your takeaways from this. Uh, MSI is an umbrella term, right? So there are, I, I focused here on 11 active classifications with the US, with the US Department of Education. Uh, the racial enrollment eligibility for HSI specifically is 25% uh, for, of Latina, Latino, Latinx undergraduates. For anapesis, it's actually 10% Asian American and Pacific Islander undergraduate students. And remember, tidbit about anapesis, Native American Pacific Islander actually refers to indigenous peoples of the Pacific, so Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander. Uh, HSIs in the aggregate and anapesis represent the largest number of eligible MSIs, but continue to be the least funded. Um, I did want to say that even without federal recognition, these institutions will continue to enroll racially minoritized and other minoritized students. And then finally, as campus and community members, thank you so much for joining this call, right? We are now making sense of and advancing what it means to be an MSI. I know I talked a lot about the MSI data project, so I'm going to give them a quick shout out here, uh, msidata.org, if you want to um, type that in or save or start following them on Twitter. And then I hope you enjoyed today's UNLV College of Education Scholarship and Practice web lecture series. You don't have to wait too long because our next web lecture series will be like lecture will be next Monday, April 1st from 12 to 1 p.m. Pacific time with Dr. Ung Sung uh, Albert Lee, an assistant professor in the Department of Educational Psychology, Leadership and Higher Education. Dr. Lee will be presenting on learning to advance anti-racism together, research practice par partnerships for racial justice. And I have also had the pleasure to work with Dr. Lee. So next week's webinar will be a treat. And now I'm going to open up for questions and I'll leave my contact here for a split second. Please follow me, please email me. I would love to hear from you. What are the most designations oh, a university can have? So there's not a limit on how many institute and how many classifications uh, an institution can meet. But as you can see, uh, the example with your college, they pretty much basically meet six <laughs> uh, uh, um, designations. Uh, and your college is the one that beats the most. So that's why I wanted to highlight them. Do I foresee UNLV qualifying for any additional MSI uh, designations in the future? I mean, we'll see, right? Like, especially regarding uh, the racial enrollment eligibility criteria, that, that could be a possibility. Um, I think someone who is much smarter than me can probably do a projection. Thank you, Ava. I appreciate that. <laughs> Oh, Jen, pretend it's not me. I'm a development officer. How should I approach using UNLV's dual designations in fundraising? Thank you so much, Jen. You know, it's kind of related to the comment that I left, right, around uh, some, some folks, you know, have now since left their institutions that have now become or met these M different MSI classifications or criteria. Uh, and I think there's an opportunity there, one, <laughs> for folks to learn a little bit more, to be introduced to this, um, to these classifications, uh, and also leveraging, especially with regard to like um, development or even philanthropy, like investing in um, either or incentivizing for things to be funded that can further push the university uh, or college uh, to be more in alignment with those 
with these designations, because often we kind of leave it alone as like, oh, we just meet this federal uh, designation and only see it for the grant opportunity. But I, but I think what, you know, as higher education scholars have been showing us, like, we need to think more broadly about that. Like, folks are very proud to be any of these particular types, right? So um, there is an opportunity there to, like, be more um, intentional about, um, yeah, making sense of these designations there. How rare is it for UNLV to be dual designated? How many institutions with two? Ooh, uh, such great questions. Thank you so much, Jen. Uh, you know, some maybe like some teasers regarding my dissertation study one. I am, com I am working on my descriptive quantitative study, really counting how many and where are these dual and multiple designated minority serving institutions. And from that, so I did aggregate HSIs together. Um, but, you know, the largest number of dual designated institutions are really dual designated and a PZ HSIs. Um, and right now, as of 2023, there's 111. Uh, so it has grown. Um, and if you think about that, that's nearly half of all, um, or actually a little over half of all ana um, eligible anapesies are also HSIs. And then said differently, that's one in five HSIs is an anapesie. Any other questions, comments, reactions? <laughs> uh, is there any accountability for the graduation rates for these populations? So if we're stri talking strictly about um, like the federal definition, no, right? Like we're just seeing the percentage. Uh, it would be really part of, um, what do you call it? If an institution were to meet um, the these designations or these classifications and then further get the federal funding, there's measures in place there for assessment or evaluation on those particular programs. Sometimes they're tied to graduation rates. Oh, thank you so much, Maria. Uh, and so that's kind of where that accountability comes in. I did want to mention the the federal pro U.S. Department of Education programs because you know that is an opportunity to kind of push our federal government, push the U.S. Department of Education to then embed those kind of account those certain accountability measures that might not. Oh, yeah, they may or may not be there, um, depending on which criteria we're talking about. So thank you, Lauren, for that good question. Thanks, Young Buck, for answering that. Ooh, Esther, good question. I'm wondering why CSN also lost the anaphysian designation, but... Like I said, right, it's sometimes it is tied to that racial enrollment um, threshold. Sometimes it's that perfect. Thank you. <laughs> um, and so uh, institutions will, you know, fluctuate back and forth, uh, whether or not they meet the designation. Also, it, whether if it's not that, sometimes an institution actually doesn't submit for um, and there might be other rationales why, like if they're not submitting a waiver, more on that. <laughs> I wish I could see everybody. This is sad. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's possible. It's either, yeah, the waiver application or um, it could, yeah, or it could be the, the racial enrollment threshold itself. Mm -hmm. Yes. The reason why I'm saying them differently is because um, you, an institution cannot submit a waiver based on racial enrollment criteria. The waiver is strictly about the finance um, aspect of the eligibility criteria. Right, exactly. And that's why I wanted to highlight, you know, like when I was looking up and reading more about the history of Hispanic serving institutions, um, you know, in the original iteration or these um these ideas for the HSI, it was not strictly to just be tied to an undergraduate um, percentage threshold at all. Like they had multiple different other eligibility criteria. So it would have filtered a lot more colleges and universities and would have probably built in that accountab accountability measure, right? That um, some of you are referring to or even alluding to. So yeah, it's, <laughs> I mean, I, I'm not, someone who is in Congress or anything, but I imagine, yeah, it was kind of tied in the, the negotiation, perhaps. 
Absolutely. I appreciate you, Jose. Thank you so much about, you know, intentional engagement around Asian American specific Islanders uh, and uh, Hispanic and Latino students. Because I think that can get lost easily if we just stick with um, just like the federal uh, grants, um, just the opportunity to kind of think more broadly, right? And again, I want to lift up the higher ed scholars who have really been uh, doing this work for many years. Have institutions been successful in using MSI designations in student recruitment techniques? Oh, what about student faculty staff retention? Hmm. In student recruitment techniques. <clears throat> well, I have not measured these myself, but I understand that there are certainly colleges and universities ha have leveraged these different MSI classifications, whether or not they're an HSI or um, an Anapizi. It's literally in like, you know, the their recruitment materials in admissions or even in um, when you apply for a job. Like I've definitely seen that in some academic job postings now, right? Really promoting that the university or college is an Anapizi or an, or an HSI and what have you. So there's that. Um, and I mean, even for me as someone who is soft launching onto the job market, I, I, you know, had to wrestle with and write about like, oh, why the school, why is like them being, or why is it that if they're, for example, like an HSI or an Anapizi, like I engage with that particular part in my cover letters. So yeah, that has kind of, for me been a successful recruitment technique. Uh, what about student fa staff, faculty staff retention? Certainly I want to uplift um, many Anapizi and HSI funded programs that have that in mind, right? Like they have, it's very student centered. They build that um, in their design of their program. So for example, I'm thinking of, I'm gonna lift up like a Sacramento State's full circle project. Um, it's a cohort system where they go through two semesters of an Asian American studies or an ethnic studies course together. Uh, really, you know, that's their entry point into their, their college experience. They go through it together. And then the second semester, they connect with community partners that are Asian American or Pacific Islander. So I really, uh, I really loved that uh, particular uh, program. Uh, so that's an example, right, of retaining students. So that's just one. Faculty staff, um, I can't think of one in mind, but, you know, if we think creatively, what could that look like for a cluster hire and what have you, right? Uh, these designations are helpful in understanding the makeup of campuses. However, what strategies are being implemented to holistically serve these populations of students beyond having affinity groups and celebrations? Absolutely. For example, racism experienced on campus by these students. Ooh, very, very good question, Joseph. I, you know, I, I think that's something that I don't have an answer right away. Um, and often I have found, at least with the folks who I've, you know, had the privilege and honor to get to speak with and talk to regarding either if it's an HSI specific program or an Anapizi specific funded program, that they're on the front lines trying to do that, actually. Uh, if if not, like the college or university is very much relying on these uh, these funded programs and the, the student affairs folks were very much often on the front lines of these institutions, um, making you know, creating space for these kind of conversations to happen and also on the front lines of like getting, uh, being asked uh, around what to do next, uh, whatever that could look like, um, whether that is, you know, even sponsoring or having, uh, what do you call it, uh, an inter interactive communication space, I, I forget the name, uh, in like intergroup dialogue space or um, or, or having workshops or, or just reaching out to students like in a very humane one-on-one -on -one basis way. Uh, often I have seen the student affairs folks, the admin faculty staff who are working in these funded programs at the front lines of that. Um, and I think that is the strategy, I guess. But I think I, I'm wary to just um, put folks who have also been precariously in that position, right? Some, sometimes they're not institutionally funded and they're grant-based. Um, they, I mean, uh, they're in these positions that could also be gone after five years, uh, but then often they're, they are relied on. So of course, strategy to have them. And then also how about institutionalizing uh, these programs that uh, are working, these, these positions that are really doing the bulk of the labor. Thanks, Jen, for sharing that.
Uh, and I, I know I'm I'm doing a disservice by not remembering everyone, but that's why I wanted to highlight, right? Like uh, Dr. Adina Garcia's book. I know she was she's really good at highlighting um, practitioners on the ground who are literally on the front lines doing this work. So um, yeah, I'd want to look that up too. So, and that definitely goes beyond the affinity and celebration one month things. I have three more minutes. If anyone wants to continue to chat with me, I'll be here. Thank you so much, Mercedes. Thank you, Joy. Oh, yes. Thank you so much, Jen. Yeah. And I know that, yeah, UNLV cannot just be a minority serving institution on its own. It's because, yes, the university meets these very specific MSI classifications. So that was great. Thank you for lifting that up, Jen. Thank you. No, absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Oh, thank you, y'all. Yeah. And Dr. Barlow, hello. Oh, and hi. <laughs> all the friends. I love seeing all the familiar names. <laughs> 